Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We normally start our show off with a warning uh, to change your channel to more of a soft rock listening station. Uh, and today in particular, we probably should give you a warning because we have Dr. Stephen Baskerville with us. And he has his new book, A Gentleman's Guide to Manners, Sex, and Ruling the World. So if, you, if you're listening at all to what I'm saying, you should probably change the channel. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of manly spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. Zoop up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak, coming to you from Waikiki Beach. Uh, yesterday, Cindy and I cruised up to the North Shore. Massive surf, uh, twenty foot faces, very disorganized. Uh, it was. Uh, we like we like to have our swells travel at least a thousand miles so they get organized, uh, so their their form and their and the swell direction is more uh, more predictable, and so you can drop in and surf uh, longer faces. But yesterday, it was chaotic. It was big. It was dangerous just to just to even consider paddling out. And uh, so we watched from the safety of shore. But it reminded me of kind of like the chaotic situation that we see in our world today. There's a lot of uh, a, a positioning for power, a lot of power uh, being being forced this way and that way. And uh, But it seems chaotic. We've kind of lost our, our direction as a society. We've walked away from uh, uh, traditional values. And, you know, here in Hawaii, there's a, there's a sense here. My wife really sees it having been from Florida. There's a sense here in Hawaii of men uncling younger men. Uh, there's really a brotherhood of men in Hawaii, and I think part of it is because of the water. The water humbles us. Uh, we paddle out together, whether you're a lawyer or a, or a banker or a welder or the postman. We don't really even know what each other d does for we work. We just know each other from our waterman skills. And out in the water, it kind of equalizes us. But what you see is a rite of passage as young boys paddle out uh, with their little boards near the shore and gra eventually there's a moment when they paddle out to the big surf and I remember when each of my sons in their turn had that rite of passage with me where I'm sitting in the lineup and I look to my t side and there's one of my sons surfing with me and the uncles uh, watch out for them the uncles correct them I remember one time my son called me from the came in from the bonsai pipeline uh, Jeremiah which, on an 18 foot day very treacherous day and one of my friends up there, Lance Okano, who's one of the what we call one of the enforcers here in Hawaii, he told my son to go in. And he goes, Lance, what did I do? And Lance said, y "You disrespected your father. You don't surf the pipeline. You go in." And I'd had <laughs> I'd had a moment with my son Jeremiah uh, about six months earlier, and I'd walked down to the coffee shop to get some coffee, and Lance was there. And I was going, "Oh man, I had my challenge with my son." and just kind of bemoaned the situation. But he uncled my son and said, you go in, if you disrespect your father, you don't come out here with, your, with the other men and surf these waves. And that's what we're lacking in our world today is, is I think that, that, uncling, um, that uncling element where other men uh, will challenge and encourage and grow up the younger men, especially in a world where so many women who have been betrayed by a man don't like men. They hate men, but they're raising a man. And we, so we need men like Dr. Stephen Baskerville in his book, Gentleman's Guide to uh, Manners, Sex, and Ruling the World. I can't go into all that you, all that your your whole background, Stephen, but uh, you're a professor at the Collegium Intermanum in Warsaw and serves as president of the Inter-American Institute of Philosophy, Politics, and Social Thought. So I think that basically covers everything. Uh, but you, you're, you're coming to us from Romania, which is really a, a country that's come out of, wow, you know, the darkest, uh, darkest of situations. So uh, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Thank you. It's very good to be here. Uh, you got to tell us, uh, what's the weather like in Romania right now? I mean, right, it was 82 degrees out here yesterday and sunny. I'm just curious what the weather's like in Romania. I don't know if I'm man enough to, to handle what you do out living out there. It's not so bad. It's remarkably similar to where I grew up in, in the Middle Atlantic region. It's, uh, it's not so bad. We have warm summers, but the winters are fairly mild. So it's, it's very nice. What do, you right mean, what do you mean by fairly mild? What does that mean? Well, it's about uh, zero today, uh, centigrade, <laughs> about 32 Fahrenheit. Uh, Spoken so as a true. For, for a warm coat. 
yeah, spoken as a spoken true man. Me. In other words, a windbreaker wouldn't do it today. <laughs> no, not unless you're a, a very hardy Romanian. All I know is I'm Ukrainian, but I fled North Dakota as a young child. We we moved to California, and, and I have Nordic neurosis. I can't handle the I mean, cold hurts. Cold is very painful. But we're we're so we're glad not to. Too far from the, uh, go ahead. Me, I was going to say we're not far from the Romanian bo- from the Ukrainian border here. Yeah, we're like we're like cousins. Yeah. Well, you know, it's so good to have you on the show, and I, 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 I love the, the, the subject needs to be talked about. Can you help me out just by, it's a tough question, I know, because it covers so much, but how do you define uh, what a gentleman is? Well, that's a good question. I actually, I never really do define that in 25 words or less, because it's a, it's a subject that's been, it's a topic that's been defined over the centuries, uh, uh, in, in books, in novels, in, in stories, in poems. Um, it goes back to the Middle Ages, really, the code, knighthood, knighthood codes, and it was modified in the Renaissance uh, and the Reformation, and very much in the 19th century in England and America. So it's, it's evolved over the centuries, but what, what it has, is, the basis of it is a, is a, a, a tension between the idea of, of a gentleman as a status, uh, you know, the accoutrements that we, we associate with a, a gentleman, uh, the manners, the, the breeding, the well-dressed you know, heirs and so forth, and also an ethical element, an ethical element. And over the centuries, what has defined the, the term is the tension between those two. And so much of the theme over the centuries is, is that the men who look like gentlemen and, and are said to be gentlemen don't always behave like gentlemen. They don't always live up to the ethical ideal. So that's how it's how it's evolved. You know, are you a, do you have the trappings, the appearance of a gentleman, or do you have the real thing? Right. And, you know, the thing is, I, I was watching a, during this this COVID situation, my wife and I watched all, I'm a Louis L'Amour fan. You, I don't know if you know, you're familiar with the great Western writer, Louis L'Amour. Uh, his last editor was my first editor and Louis L'Amour wrote over a hundred Westerns. He's the Western author, as far as I'm concerned, a great, great storyteller. But in his books, the heroes were always what I would say, what a real gentleman is. They, they step between the vulnerable and danger. Uh, they, they lived by a code. There was honor, there was humility. And, and we're really missing that. But my wife and I watched a lot of the movies. Every movie that we could find that was based on one of Louis L'Amour's books, uh, we watched during this whole COVID thing. And one of them we watched, I forget which John Wayne movie it was, but it's the, John Wayne made this statement to a young kid or a young man. He said, in order to be a gentleman, you, still, you first have to be a man. In order to be a gentleman, you first have to be a man. And so uh, when that, within that context in the world today, What's the message, uh, the essence of, of your message that, you know, you wrote a book, How to Be a Gentleman. It's a how-to book. And Very we need to so, know. Yes. Yeah. T- tell us well, more about you're that. You're right about that. The, the prerequisite is to be a man. And I do talk about both themes, themes of manliness and, and, and uh, uh, masculinity, but also the specific code of a gentleman. And they're obviously closely connected and, and overlap. I would say maybe one slight difference is that the, the idea of a gentleman is that a man not only of physical courage, uh, but also a man of moral courage, a, a leader in some ways. And I think sometimes, I, I mention that because uh, I think sometimes that's what we're lacking today. I see a lot of men today with physical courage, who I admire very much. Um, but I sometimes feel like we maybe lack moral courage, and we also maybe lack a lot of men. Uh, we lack men who can tell us what moral courage is and what, and what, it, re- what, it, what it requires nowadays. Uh, in in terms of the you know the confusion and the crisis that you you alluded to at the beginning, we need. I think we need. There's such a crisis, and you know one of the things I hear, Stephen, is I hear this from men. Oh, uh, the women, you know, rule that the the, the women do ta- have taken over the church, or the women have taken over education, or the women have taken over <laughs> this and taken over that, and it makes me want to throw up. It's it comes from me to I think of it as a real victim. Uh, uh, mentality of being blameful and blameless and not taking any kuleana, as we say here in Hawaii, responsibility. If women have taken over too much, it's because you vacated and created a vacuum and they had to step in. And so uh, the challenge is for men to stand up and be men again, to not not acquiesce. Being a gentleman doesn't mean to acquiesce. It means to, to pick your fights wisely, to choose your fights, but not to back. That's the thing about the Western the Western cowboy. They didn't pick fights, but they never backed down from one either. And we see, I see men backing down. It's the main way men behave today is a back down when there's a confrontation. Don't want to step into the fray. 
Well, yes, I do talk about that a lot, actually. I speak about the, the need to, to uh, you know, the, the code of chivalry is, is not just defending women, but defending anyone who's oppressed or the victim of injustice. And I speak about that a lot. I say, one of the things I say is that a gentleman must be prepared, if necessary, to be, to be disliked and hated and, and challenged. Um, I do talk about the grievances a bit that you mentioned, and I, I, I think I, my book is a little different than most in that I take them very seriously because I've written previous books about them, and I know they're very true. I think all of the grievances that you mentioned and, and more uh, are, are entirely correct. I mean, the men are right about this, um, and some of them are horrible. I mean, some of them are just absolutely horrifying, especially given the work that I've done previously on family courts and the divorce system, which is not only unjust, but hideously uh, repressive and tyrannical. But having said all that, and I, I do say it again, <laughs> needs to but be you're, said. you're correct about that. I, I also come back to that point and say you cannot, you cannot be the ver- mirror image of feminists. You cannot uh, play the victim. You cannot indulge in self pity. You know, it's one of right. the most debilitating things for a man. You've got to, and that's why the, tit- the subtitle of the book is "Ruling the World." Well, I say we, that you know, the men are the are the natural leaders, the natural rulers of society, and, and as soon as you put away your uh, I, I tell men that they have to put away their, their childish adolescent rebellion um, if it's still lingering and uh, assume that, you know, that, that they are the natural leaders of the world. And, okay, and assume well, that role, even, even we, if they're taking you off in handcuffs. Uh, we got to take a know, hard break, okay. doctor, but we'll be we'll right back because you just provoked a lot of people to turn off the radio or to tell their friends to tune in. So we'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure and Dr. Stephen Baskerville. I'll be right back. This is Daniel the Boone Markham with another episode of Country Up, White. The color white was on my mind one fall day as I was moseying down the old Ronald Reagan freeway through Simi Valley, California. Four white cars, one right behind the other, were coming up behind me at a fast enough clip to cause me to nudge my pickup over to the outside lane. Scurrying by, each car had its own variety of white. Two sort of ugly one not impressive, and one hotter than a Brandon iron on a roundup morning. The color white is one intriguing color. Some think of it as just plain old white. For me, white stands a few hands above its compadre colors, as white is something you can easily add any other color and still make beautiful. And yet, white can stand on its own and look mighty fine just as is. Makes me recall when I was a little Catholic boy. Our nun taught us about sin at catechism class. For you Protestants, that's Catholic Sunday school held on Wednesday nights. She would put black spots on a white circle to demonstrate what sin did to our hearts. Well, anywho, in a world that's in serious denial about personal responsibility, a man who is true to himself got to admit that he's accumulated an assortment of those black spots. It was Jesus who said the shedding of his blood was the price paid for ridding our hearts of those black spots. By faith, I regularly and humbly apply Christ's blood to my black spots as they seem to come back real regular-like. Darn it anyhow. Something you might want to consider doing for yourself, that is, taking care of your black spots. Jesus is in the business of erasing such things. This is Dan Laboon Markham at countryup.org on a journey a few miles this side of heaven. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha, welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. My co-adventure guide today is Dr. Stephen Baskerville. He's a tough guy. I already know that because he's living in Romania right now. And he said, uh, when I asked him what the weather was there, he said, oh, it's a mild zero degrees or 32 degrees Fahrenheit. It's at the freezing point. But we were talking about this, this, this. Uh, you know, Dr. Baskerville, I don't use the word masculinity anymore. I like to use manliness because it provokes 
it provokes things in peop people's thoughts. And masculinity, the whole word, has been twisted and co-opted, uh, and, and there's an agenda behind that. Now, we see now, uh, yesterday I read in the paper that this young man who's, a transgen who, who's transgender and competing in, uh, I believe, collegiate or high school swimming, uh, was finally defeated by another transgender man uh, yesterday. And it's, it's like what used to be called good is evil. What we, what we used to call evil is good. Now, everything's being flipped on its head. Thank goodness for your book, you know, Gentleman's Guide to, uh, let's see, it's a Gentleman's Guide to Manners, Sex, and Ruling the World. Um, tell me more about the, the, the crisis in manliness and what, what we can do about that. Well, it's no, um, it's no, <clears throat> excuse me, no secret that, uh, you know, that manliness is, is under attack, both by, uh, you know, impersonal forces uh, of our society, if you like, but also by quite deliberate cultural and ideological forces, most, the most obvious of which is, you know, radical uh, political ideologies like feminism and homosexualism and transgenderism. Um, and this has created a new climate, uh, a new, a new challenge today for men. I mean, men have always had challenges to their masculinity, but traditionally it's come from other men, uh, the bully on the block or the rival in love. And, and the, the remedy for that is simple. If you feel deficient in your manliness, you get more of it. You go to the gym, you take fancy lessons, you take Charles Atlas courses. You, you, you know. But today it, it's different because this being more manly is, is actually what many men fear to be. You know, we were told it's toxic to be, to be manly and masculine. So men don't know quite how to handle it. Some react by, by trying to, you know, calling for things like, as you say, gender equality, and they, they even, have, you know, use the jargon of their opponents, of the, of the feminists, you know, they, they, they say they're second class citizens and so forth. Um, but I say, that I argue that, you know, you can't do that. You've got to, uh, I go to the traditional, uh, the traditional books like the one I wrote, uh, you know, the traditional genres, which go back to the, again, to the Renaissance, and the Middle Ages. And I argue that many of the traditional codes of manliness are still valid. They're still very much the ones we need to hear, but sometimes they need to be reformulated in new language that will meet the, the challenges of today, the, you know, the cultural and ideological challenges. Um, because I was surprised how many books like mine and, and internet sites uh, similar, similarly uh, are very politically correct. They're watered down. They, they, they actually you know, more or less advise men to be, to be more like women. Uh, and um, this is, you know, this is obviously not the solution either. Um, so, you know, we don't want the hyper masculinity of, of the gangs and the, don't need the machoism and, the and all of that. Right. 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 Exactly. But we also don't want men to be to be effeminate either. So this is the, this has been the trick over the centuries is to is to, as you say, the uh, virtues like uh, humility, self-effacement, um, but also um, not timidity and not being a doormat, not let, let, letting people walk over you or walk over anybody else, for that matter, but stepping up and, and taking the challenges, even if it means being hated and despised. And that's, you know, that's a big part of it. You know, I, it, it's true. This whole thing about um, humility is not being a doormat. And now uh, there's a comes a time when uh, people don't want to offend anybody. People aren't willing to stand up for their moral beliefs because they're afraid they're going to offend some somebody. Well, you don't want to be an offensive person, but you need to not be afraid to offend people if you if if it's time to speak the truth and and draw the line. Yes, I, and I say that very very clearly, and I, I add that. Uh, but you shouldn't offend people for for frivolous or for personal reasons. You should you should save this option for the most the most important thing. Um, as Oscar Wilde is reputed to have said, um, you know, a gentleman never offends unintentionally. Right. So you, it, yeah, it's it's a direct. Uh, can I tell you something? It's kind of a, uh, a, a, a different, kind of a strange story, maybe to some people. But there's a man out here that surfs a spot here called Queens Break. It's a great like, world class surf break right in front of my house, and I rarely surf there. I tend to paddle out further to to to, to the reefs on the outside. But he's a bully. He's a bully. And I've seen him bully tourists for years, and he always tended to pick a fight with me during the world titles when we had the tandem surf teams in town, and, and I always ha had a moment of having to back him down. You know, you know how bullies are. But I found out about three years ago that he was the one that had bullied my son Jeremiah when he came back from fighting in the war in Afghanistan. This is many, many years ago. And, but I found out it was him. And I, and, and I paddled out that morning and said, Lord, if he's there, I'm going to deal with him. 
paddled out, stand-up paddleboard, paddled out towards Queen's Break, and he was there. And I said, good, when I come back from surfing, I'm going to deal with him. First, I had to go get my surfing in. But then I came into that break, and because he was a man who had bullied people, humiliated tourists, and just, just lorded his, his, you know, people don't want to fight back with a bully. Just kind of leave us alone. We just want to surf, you know. But the but surf surf breaks, especially point breaks, a reef break like that, they'll tend to be kind of a hierarchy in the lineup. But you don't need a bully, right? And I mean, one of the biggest things a surfer can do is give a wave to someone. You know, they, it's their wave. They're on the peak. It's their chance to go, and they give it to someone. So I yelled out to everybody in the lineup, "Hey, everybody!" There's a world famous surfer here, and everywhere I go around the world, this is true. They go, "Who's that jerk in the lineup at Queens?" So I, st- I paddle in the middle of the lineup on my stand-up board, so I'm higher than everybody else. And there's a, there's a world famous surfer here. He's famous all over the world. Everywhere I go, people ask me, "Who is that blankety blank jerk in the lineup at Queens Break?" And he's right here. He's world famous, and I just kept, oh, I kept doing to him what he had done to other people. And he eventually got provoked, and he, and he started yelling back at me. And I said, you know what? I don't, like to, I don't like to yell. Let's go to the beach and fight. So we paddled to the beach, and I had this kind of all orchestrated. I knew exactly what was going to happen. I keep egging him on as we paddle a minute or so, two minutes to get to the beach. And we get to the beach. My wife hops up. She's going to be so happy to see me come in. And there's hundreds of tourists on the beach. And we said, as we got into three feet of water, I pointed to him, and I said, Hey, everybody, there's a world-famous surfer here. Everybody all over the world asks me who this big jerk is that hassles all the tourists and bullies all of you, and he's right here. He's world-famous. So he's in three feet of water. Hard to fight in three feet of water. You know, and I won't tell you the rest of the story. I have it all how, how it all went down, but essentially I knew that the lifeguards would be there and the cops would be there, and, and uh, it, 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 it something very funny happened. He got real close to me, and I was had just had a cigar, and I was in ketosis because I was uh, I was fasting, and uh, that gives you super bad breath. And he got so close to me, it was like he. <laughs> I think my breath alone <laughs> defeated him, but what I did to him there is I stood up to him. And, and, and I don't mean I don't I'm not talking about the physicality uh, uh, of always backing down to uh, back backing down a bully. But but Dr. Baskerville, when I was young, I told my wife this yesterday, six or seven times I was bullied to the point where I had to fight. And I knew I was I was younger than the other guys in my I was the youngest one in my class. And I knew that when I fought that I was going to lose and I lost every fight. But I, w- I contemplated this years later, and I thought that didn't make me a loser. That made me a fighter. That we need as men, we need to go against all odds, and we need to stand up, especially we see these women in the school board meetings. They're the ones standing up and fighting for, for what's going on in the school. It's the women who are on the, on the city councils or on the church councils. Men need to stand up and at least take some servant leadership and, uh, and, 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 and fight, fight the good fight. We have, we, we have a battle that's raging all around us, and we're afraid to offend anybody. Yeah, very, very true. In fact, I, I, I made that point that you just made even more explicitly than in the book. The, the current issue of Chronicles magazine, um, I have an article about manliness and, and what you just said. So it's, um, I didn't make it quite so explicitly in the book, but it's in the Chronicles magazine article. Well, well tell, tell us that. Tell us what, what statement you made. Well, it's, it's an article about manliness and how we need it, how it's lost in our society today. Uh, I quote uh, Tucker Carlson and some other people who, are, who point this out exactly, that, uh, that um, especially in the, in the conservative movement and the Republican Party especially. They're too nice. Um, you know, They're too nice. With, with the left, uh, with the left in control nowadays, uh, much of the conservatives and especially the Republican Party are very, very diffident. So it's not just a cultural matter. It has direct impact on, on our politics as well. Yeah, they're, they're too nice. And I get introduced sometimes. I've yeah. had my wife's been with me. This is Bear Wozniak. He's a real nice guy. And I go, no, I'm not. No, I want to be a good right. man. I want to be a good man. But I'm not a nice guy. Don't confuse the two. They're very different things. A good man pursues the, good, the true good and is willing to lay down his life in self-donation for that true good to come to pass. It's not being the acquiescent as you said, the, 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 the man who defers always understates, never, never challenges. And we need more men that will stand up like that. We're talking with Dr. Stephen Baskerville. I love your, the title of your book. We, uh, we've kind of covered the first part of it. It's a gentleman's guide to manners, which we kind of talked about here, that we need to be bold enough to speak the truth. We need to, if we're going to offend, offend wisely, but we will be willing to stand up. And, 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 then, and then it says and, and manners, sex, 
and ruling the world. When we get back, I want to talk with you, Stephen, about uh, about uh, the sexual revolution and the impact it's had on our society. Uh, this is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. This book, by the way, is published by Sophie Institute, my publishing company, and I'm so proud of them for, for publishing this book, and I believe they've published another book by you, too, uh, to have Dr. Stephen Baskerville with us. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Aloha, this is Bear Wozniak coming to you from my home in Waikiki Beach. I can remember uh, in my home in Molokai, the island that my mom and dad lived at. He would, my dad was a deacon in Molokai, the home of, of course, St. Damien and St. Mary Ann. And from my condo on the west side, when the surf would get big, I could hear the waves breaking on the rocks. And I could hear boulders smashed against each other and the loud banging noise that they would make. But I would be asleep, but in the middle of the night, I would hear these things and I would dream about big waves and a certain adrenaline would start to fill me of fear and excitement. And then I'd wake up at two in the morning and I'd realize way out in the deep, rolling like thunder, there is a wave that was gonna arrive five or six hours later and that I would paddle out and that wave and I would have an appointment and I would turn and I'd paddle in and carve across the face of that wave. Way, way, way out in the deep right now, there's a wave that's rolling like thunder coming for you and coming for me. This wave, I believe, is the new springtime that John Paul II spoke about. The wave of renewal, the wave of revival, the wave of the new spring. We've seen 200 million people martyred in the name of atheism in the last century. That's according to the University of Hawaii. The church has always believed that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And I believe that all of the suffering of the 20th century, somehow in some way, maybe not in a huge way, maybe in a very deep way, there will be significant deep conversion. There is a wave rolling like thunder, the largest wave you've ever seen, rolling and rolling out of the distance, and it's gonna be here at the break of day. Paddle out, be ready to meet it, and drop into the power of the Holy Spirit and move in the new evangelization. This is Bear Wozniak with deepadventure.com. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to notredamefcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha. Welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Our co-adventure guide today is Dr. Stephen Baskerville. He's written a book, The Gentleman's Guide to, Se to Manners, Sex, and Ruling the World. And I want to talk, ask you about this area of sex. Uh, Dr. Baskerville, uh, St. Pope John Paul II wrote this. One of the first things he wrote was called uh, uh, Sex and Responsibility. I think it was Sex and Responsibility. I think it was Love and Responsibility. It was Love and Responsibility. And another one of our uh, popes wrote an encyclical, Humanae Vitae, uh, coming out against the pill uh, and how it would destroy uh, society from within. And I, I know when I was a young man, there was a social contract among, among most women that they wouldn't have sex outside of marriage. In fact, for some of the, you know, it was, it was, it was uh, it, they, they kind of held that line. But I was there during the sexual revolution. 
you know, when uh, easy sex or free love and all of that. Um, how is that? This you talk about the area of being a gentleman in this area of sexuality. What 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 is your um, diagnosis and prescription? Well, that's a that's a complicated question, and it's a large section of the book because it is it, it was the most challenging section to write. Um, on the one hand, uh, a lot of it deals with courtship, and I, I tend to extol uh, traditional courtship as opposed to the trends that you mentioned, uh, dating and hooking up and uh, you know, right. legal warfare right. uh, and so forth. Uh, I also point out that according to the, the church, the churches over the centuries, uh, a gentleman uh, has always been expected to get his uh, impulses of various kind under control, and that includes you know, alcohol, um, anger, um, nowadays drug use, but sex in some ways is the big one. So it's always been required that you, you know, a young man get, needs to get his sex drive under control uh, in order to, um, you know, in order to be a ruler, you know, it's, it's, it's what Milton said about Oliver Cromwell. You know, he he, he conquered himself first before he conquered others. Um, wow. And also, of course, because of again, as you said, the sexual revolution has had a devastating impact on men. <clears throat> and to put it in a nutshell, my argument about that is that it, 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 we were lured into a honey trap. Men in the 60s, 70s were, uh, you know, told about all this free love and free sex. Uh, you know, before that, of course, was the Playboy generation, which which predates that in the 1950s in some ways. And men were lured into this, you know, this belief that they could have recreational sex uh, and women were willing to do it. Uh, and then what happened? It turned around and suddenly all that free love, all that freedom and sexual license turned into authoritarianism, didn't it? So, so suddenly we men started being accused of sexual harassment and sexual assault and sexual this and sexual that. So there was a price to be paid for all that indulgence. And um, men are paying it now, and then oftentimes it is unjust and it is unfair. But you know, I, I, the few, one of the few moments when I wax theologic in the book is when I say that he, he, you know, a false rape accusation is a, is a horrible injustice uh, from, uh, you know, from, from uh, human courts. But it's a perfectly valid reminder from God that a, a gentleman is expected to, you know, adhere to, to higher, um, higher standards. So, um, you know, men have to be careful. Men, and basically, I argue that a man, a gentleman, uh, needs to be the leader in restoring the, you know, the traditional morality uh, uh, and relationship between the sexes. He needs to take the lead. Women, women need to have a role in this also, especially older men and older women, uh, on imposing or sexual order, sexual control on the young. Um, but that's, it's a very important part. And when I see superannuated teenagers, um, you know, uh, indulging in you know, in, 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 in sexual license. Uh, I, I want to tell the men that, you know, you're, you're hurting yourselves. Um, right. It, it's really in, in, a, in, a, in a man's self-interest and, and a yes. gentleman's responsibility to society and to his close closest to him to exercise the leadership in, in reimposing uh, sexual control on society. And that means things like, you know, family, uh, religious faith, community standards, simple old fashioned shame. But it, start, it starts out with, I think, uh, the, the, the sexuality is such a powerful... I mean, so I love uh, uh, St. Pope John Paul II's writings on the theology of the body. It, so, so, so powerful, his 135 homilies uh, on that subject. But, you know, I, it, I look around and I see the swipe left, swipe right type of mentality. And then the women, uh, when my wife and I go out and I go speak someplace, we'll, often, we'll always be huddled around by a group of women of all, all different ages. And they'll ask me, when, when will you teach men to be men again? Uh, they hang out with us. We, they, we do things, but they never ask us out on a date. And if they ask us out on a date, they never ask us to marry them. And if they do that, then we never, we never set a date. And, uh, but, you know, it's like, it, it, I mean, men are men, weaker. I wouldn't even call them men, but boys, if they can have sex for free and they can have all, that, all of that for free with no responsibility, don't expect them to step up. So part of the kuleana is for the women to learn to say no. Uh, but what happens in those cases is all of a sudden then they're the girl that's not going to be getting a date. But they have to be willing to make that stand and trust in God to bring not a, a good man to them. But but boys are getting away with, I will call all anyone who indulges in pornography or in, uh, in, in sexual promiscuity a boy, not a man. It takes, it takes a man to exercise, uh, exercise self-control. And when you when you uh, sleep with a woman, you're actually taking a part of her soul along with you. It's a very powerful and potent thing. And I would say our whole society 
ha- is crumbling because of uh, the whole this whole realm of 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 of, of free sex and, and and then what goes along with it is uh, people have they they get engaged after their second child is conceived. There's no long term. There's no real commitment there. Can you talk to us? I, I know I've thrown a lot out there, but about that whole area, what what yeah. is the what can men do? What men and women do to to show respect for each other's um, boundaries and sexuality again? Right, right. Well, the hard, the hardest part of the book uh, to write was the book was the part of marriage uh, because um, I know that you know many men do want marriage. They want to, they want to marry. They want uh, a wife. They want children. Uh, they want to carry on their name. They want a stable life, you know, in their, in their later years. Um, so it's not men are not entirely self-indulgent. They do want to be responsible, and the, and the odds are against them. I mean, the, you know, I, I I confront the phenomenon of MGTOW, the men going their own way, the men who are basically boycotting marriage and families and children and women and sex, not because they don't want these things, but because they are terrified of, for example, the family courts and the way they can be, you know, their children can right. be taken from them. That's true. Provocation, yeah, yeah. And they can end up criminalized. So how do you do this? I mean, on the one hand, I, I, they're right. They're correct about this. Right. Uh, their assessment is 100 percent factually correct. On the other hand, I also b- believe in marriage. Uh, I believe in you know, procreating the species. Uh, right. And I know these men w- within yeah, a family. Men, men right. Yeah. So so how do you resolve this? Well, I, I mean, basically, I came down on the side and I said, um, you know, uh, Hard as it is to, to face, a, a man doesn't run away from the fight, even if he thinks the odds are completely against him, and, and it's, the cause is absolutely hopeless. Uh, and that, you know, that's the situation with marriage today, and that's why I say men need moral as much as physical courage, because uh, they need to be withdrawing from marriage, boycotting marriage. It makes some sense if your if your purpose is to call attention to the problem and the injustice. Uh, as a strategy for you know for getting the world to wake up and deal deal with this, then it makes some sense. But to permanently withdraw and forego marriage, family, women, children, um, this is not human. Uh, it's not. Uh, it's obviously not Christian, uh, unless you know unless you're called to celibacy. But it, it's 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 not. You know, to give up these things is not really when you get down to it, human or manly. You cannot run away from the fight even when the odds look overwhelmingly against you. So I, I believe, again, men need to stand up, uh, defend marriage, call, take the lead in restoring it to its, its, its proper, uh, which means, you know, basically means a legally enforceable contract, frankly, right. as I've written in other books. You know, I have, I have a lot um, of friends who have been, dr- I have a lot of friends that have been drugged through court, and, and, and I think men should, should bear more of the kuleana for the children uh, after, if there's a divorce. They should probably they should carry more, but some of them have just been just just destroyed unfairly, and so they have children. Some are still at home, and they're 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 with another woman now, and that other woman has moved in, but there's never going to be a marriage. And I ask them, so what is this saying to your children? You know, uh, you, you're you're showing them uh, that your fear of being married, you're 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 showing them a uh, you're showing them a weak man, who won't courageously love a woman and lay down his life for a woman and, and, and bring and bring her into the home after marriage, of course, if it's all according to the church, the church's teaching. But instead they just, you know, and you go to church now and it most of the people in there aren't married. You know, they go to church, they'd say they're Christians, but they're living together and they're, and they're not, with, no, with no direction towards marriage. And at the Catholic Church, we have a lot of people that will come into the church and they're living together. And the church, uh, I, I don't know if it's the official church teaching, but what I hear from, from the, the priests and the bishops is, okay, during this season while you're coming to enter the church and we're, we're looking into whether, you know, if you have annulments, whether those need to be done or not, during this time if you're living together, you must live together as brothers and sisters and not engage in, 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 in sexuality until after that marriage covenant. When we come back, we're talking with Dr. Stephen Baskerville. His book is so timely. Uh, the Gentleman's Guide to, let me see if I can get it right. Um, the, the Gentleman's Guide to Manners, Sex, and Ruling the World. When we come back, can we talk about ruling the world? It's a, it's a powerful statement. It means a lot. We'll be back with Dr. Stephen Baskerville, who right, by, right now, by the way, is in Romania. And uh, he's wearing a shirt and tie if you're not watching this. On, if you're wa- listening to this on EW10 Radio instead of watching it. And I'm here, and I'm basking in the sun in, in Waikiki. So we, we know who the we know who the real man is. It's Do- Dr. Baskerville. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. 
Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to NotreDameFCU.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I want to remember, remind everybody that Sophie Institute, <coughs> excuse me, has recently republished my book, Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue. It's designed, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a book that goes into the seven virtues, the four cardinal and the three theological virtues, but it's, it's filled with narrative and, and story as well as practical common sense. And I also designed it for uh, uh, men to use in their men's groups. You know, the, it's, their chapters are short. But what is exciting to me is I see uh, men reading a chapter at a time uh, with their families uh, at, at night at dinner and talking about it and, and leading their, their families in, in the pursuit of virtue. So uh, the book is Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue, the second uh, edition. Um, and you can find it at Amazon or Sophia uh, Institute Publishing. We have Dr. Stephen Baskerville, who's also a Sophia Institute author and, uh, and has written a book called The Gentleman's Guide to Manners, Sex, and Ruling the World. Dr. Baskerville, you how dare you say ruling the world? What do you mean by that? Well, I certainly don't mean that men should uh, or gentlemen should, you know, be the, always the first to grab the, the limelight or to, uh, you know, to, to, to come up with all kinds of answers to all kinds of questions that they've posed and expect everybody to follow them. It's quite different. Um, I, I argue that, you know, ruling the world, uh, it begins with a man's self. Uh, ruling yourself, getting yourself under control, because after all, and this is a necessity, not just a, a imperative, because um, after all, men, uh, when men are in trouble, they can't really turn to welfare agencies or, um, you know, or protective services or whatever. Um, they really start, you have to start from first principles and stand up for, for yourself. And from there, you, you know, you stand up to, to, for those, to those you love, those closest to you, your family, your immediate family, your extended family, your neighbors, your friends, your work uh, associates. And from there, maybe the rest of the world, if that's what God calls you to. But it's not a matter of um, being necessarily even a political leader. But it, it, it is much larger than just, it, it does, the, the other point is that being a gentleman is not just a matter of social graces and accoutrements. It's not just a matter of knowing which way to pass the plates at a dinner party or, you know, which fork to use or, you know, how to, how to tie a, a bow tie or dance a quadrille. Um, I don't even these, know what a quadrille these, is. What is that? It's a it's a dance that goes back to the, the Renaissance. Can you do it? Can uh, you do it? Uh, I must admit, um, <laughs> we'll, have, we'll have to wait till the circumstances force me. To. <laughs> okay. Yes, one of the one of the great things about writing this book is discovering all of the uh, all of the attributes of a gentleman that I don't have. But anyway, um, <laughs> but you know these books go back to the Renaissance, and one of the themes behind them has always been ruling. I mean, the, the great, you know, the most famous books, uh, Castiglione's Book of the Courtier, or, or the you know, most notorious version, Machiavelli's The Prince, uh, was, of course, a guidebook for, for government. Uh, the, the most famous English version was Thomas Eliot's The Governor uh, under Henry VIII, and it was a guidebook for statesmen. So, and all the way through, over the centuries, this has been the theme, is that uh, to be a gentleman is to be a, a ruler, or at least a ruler of whatever domain it is that God gives you. Amen, yeah. And it doesn't mean, you know, the whole world, it doesn't mean the whole country, it means whatever you know, whatever you're called to, to, to oversee, your, yourself, first of all, and your, and your family after that. But the code of a gentleman goes back to the, you know, the shires of 17th and 16th century England. They were the, the gentry class that ruled over the... Uh, you know, the, during the English revolutions and, and later on, the, you know, the gentry class of places like Virginia, which led the American Revolution and, uh, 
Um, you know, these were the so it was a code of conduct, but it was also a code of ruling. Um, and it was a way of diluting, it, it was not a way of exercising authoritarianism over other people, it was the opposite. It was a way of assuring that every man, every householder, uh, every head of a family ruled his own little domain uh, and, and could tell the King of England or, you know, the, the, the government of the U.S. or the bureaucracy, stay out. This is, this is not your turf. This is, mm. this is my, my domain uh, that God gave me. So it's, it's a matter of diffusing and decentralizing authority, power, citizenship. And it's, well, that's what it is. It's been a code of, of citizenship going back to the, again, as I say, going back to the Reformation and the Renaissance. So it's, um, it's very important. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's, it's one of the things that we've lost. And when do we lose that? What fills the gap? Bureaucracy, centralized mm. government, uh, authoritarian government fills, fills that gap. So it's up to each man to stand up and defend his own piece of turf. Right, you know, there's this attack against patriarchy, how evil patriarchy is. But you look at what ha what what takes its place when the man isn't there. You can see it in the breakdown in many families. It's the government steps in, uh, some busybody steps in, some bureaucrat, low-level bureaucrat who has whole whole different values than maybe you do, and ru and rules your family. And so, uh, men, men ruling the world. I think it really has to start with. Um, ruling themselves, as you mentioned, er, you know, in our first segment, is, you know, keep your car clean, make your bed in the morning, take on a, resp a job, and do it, and over and and always uh, have the sense of over fulfilling your 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 commitment and your requirement uh, within the family. My wife doesn't get flowers every day, but almost, well, she definitely gets a, f a flower or two every week from me—a hand-picked flower. You know, I'm, my kuleana is to is to always woo her, and and she knows that I will set uh, that I have dreams and a vision and a direction, and and I seek her uh, affirmation or her her refinement of that, and I and my prayer for her also, Doctor Baskerville, my prayer for her always is that her wildest dreams will come true. She knows that's my prayer for her. She hears me pray it. Her wildest dreams will come true. So she has dreams and visions too. But my job is to clue into what those are and, and help her and encourage those those things to happen. But the bottom line is that the man needs to first rule himself. And that's I think it starts out with, first of all, just physically. Do you rule yourself physically? Are you in charge enough to rule your, your physical uh, life? You know, so many men that I know today... Um, when they join, you know, I have a thing. You'll, you'll love it, Dr. Baskerville. I have something called uh, Bear's Man Cave. It's at deepadventure.com. They join our, our social media group, the Man Cave, but also we have a three-year school of manliness that they go through. But one of the first things that happens when the men join the Man Cave is we'll challenge them physically. To how, how many crunches can you do? How many sit-ups can you do? What, what's your eating regimen? Are you going to be fit? Are you physically fit enough to fulfill your, your mission as a man in leadership? And, and then we'll, we'll ask, what books are you reading these days? How are you training your mind? You know, and what's your prayer life? Do you get up an hour early every day to pray? Does your family know that you're a praying man? So it's to, the, 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 the leadership within the family has to start within a personal uh, kuleana, you know, personal responsibility, ruling yourself. I love, I love what you said at the beginning of the, of the, um, of the, of the interview. No, absolutely. It's 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 been a, a theme of of you know the, the handbook for gentlemen over the centuries. It's been a theme of of uh, Christian uh, you know Christian activists over the centuries. I, I previously wrote a book about the Puritans, uh, and the Puritans. Uh, it was one of their big themes. They they popu in many ways they popularized. The concept of the gentleman and uh, and brought it across the Atlantic to to New England, um, and that was their their big theme was that you know self government requires self control, and uh, but it became was, almost you know, an, an overly overly ascetic uh, sense with not a lot of uh, um, um, the, the emotion the natural the good emotion was kind of kind of uh, supplemented as well but there was many good things there about uh, the whole essence of self-mastery self-control we don't use the word temperance i use self-mastery absolutely that's the yeah. essence so of it yeah now i go through the various you know I, I in fact there's a section on the book on vices and i talk about you know vices such as alcohol gambling um drugs um sexuality of course those are all and the weaknesses of a, of a boy those are that's not what a man does that's what a boy does am i right or wrong well, very much so. Yes. No. It's just, again, this has been a theme over the centuries. You know, I, I cite, for example, the, you know, the famous Frederick Douglass, who, uh, you know, he uh, he put away alcohol as a as a 
mature man because he, he recalled the uh, his life on the Maryland plantation where the slave owners would bring at Christmas time they would get off a week off of work and they would get alcohol whiskey provided by the slave owners to protect the, to pre prevent them from running away or plotting insurrection mm. and he realized that you know getting drunk was the getting getting the slaves drunk was part of the way that they they were controlled uh, so he, he you know he, he forego he forewent uh, issued uh, alcohol and that's you know again any any real leader discovers this uh, spontaneously or or from from reading because it's you know it goes back to Plato's Republic and of course it's a big part of the Christian the Christian ethic the man the man who gives way to to uh, to pleasure is is the, is a boy is a, is the essence of what an effeminate uh, person is a man who 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 has self mastery and 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 discipline i mean the word disciple comes from the word discipline or vice versa and it's time for men to be strong again and but we need that in the context is like my wife sees here in hawaii the brotherhood of men here the uncles uncling the younger men and, and the men challenging each other, too. So we need that. So uh, the book, again, Dr. Baskerville, is, can you say the title? You'll say it more smoothly than me. The Gentleman's Guide to Manner, Sex, and Ruling the World. And the it, subtitle is um, How to Survive as a Man in the Age of Misandry and Do So with Grace. And do so with grace. Beautiful. Thank you, Dr. Baskerville, for spending this time with us. Until next week, uh, we, ha we have this beautiful sign-off, Dr. Baskerville. The word aloha means to give breath it's because when dr cook when captain cook came uh he didn't nose breathe he shook hands they call that him a howley to have no breath if you're not from the islands you call the howley but here in hawaii we give aloha we we breathe our our love for each other it's self-donation and so we say here may the breath of the holy spirit aloha you aloha That's right. hey man I don't want you to miss out on your free stuff at deepadventure.com. Go there and subscribe to our weekly email newsletter. You get free video content, including the Bear Wozniak radio show, video version on YouTube before it even airs on EWTN. And you can follow us on all of our social media. Go to deepadventure.com and subscribe. Get your free stuff. And if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to press the subscribe button and ring that little bell. Don't miss out.